Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and uh, welcome to Worship at Webster's Webster Presbyterian Church, uh, live via Zoom or on Facebook. I have a few announcements. The annual meeting of the congregation has been called by session for Sunday, January 31st, 2021, following the morning worship, in person and on Zoom, for the purpose of receiving and approving annual reports of the governing bodies and organization of the church, receiving the proposed 2021 church budget, electing a deacon and a trustee for one-year terms, bringing forward any other appropriate matters. This Wednesday at 7 o'clock on Zoom uh, is Adult Ed Learning for a Lifetime, a lecture by Professor Bart D. Ehrman, Distinguished Professor of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill from the great courses, Lost Christianities, Christian Scriptures, and the Battles Over Authentication. Uh, the February pathway deadline is Wednesday, January 20th. Um, also, after the service, there will be a brief session meeting. So anyone from session on Zoom or in person, please stay for that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today's morning. <laughs> Today's reflection is from Martin Luther King Jr. The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and critics of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. Please join me in the call to worship. We gather to worship God, who creates us and loves us, who gifts us with diversity and makes us for community, who gives Jesus Christ to show us how to live, who inspires children, youth, young adults, and people of all ages to seek justice, share power, and live together in love and equality who invites us to join the struggle for wholeness and well-being for all, and whose presence, grace, and love
Please join me in the prayer of confession. O thou eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe has come into being, we humbly confess that we have not loved thee with our hearts, souls, and minds, and we have not loved our neighbors as Christ loved us. We have all too often lived by our own selfish impulses rather than by the life of sacrificial love as revealed by Christ. We often give in our order to receive. We love our friends and hate our enemies. We go the first mile, but dare not travel the second. We forgive, but dare not forget. And so, as we look within ourselves, we are confronted with the appalling fact that the history of our lives is the history of an internal revolt against thee. But thou, O God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for what we could have been but failed to be. Give us the intelligence to know thy will. Give us the courage to do thy will. Give us the devotion to love thy will. In the name and spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hear the assurance of pardon. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hi, boys and girls. Nice to be back with you again this Sunday. I have a special story to tell you. You know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and we have that story of when he was a little baby. And I looked, and there's not other, well, there's only one other story that I could find in the Bible about when Jesus was a child. So I'm going to tell you that story today. And if you want to look it up in your Bible, <clears throat> it's in Luke 2, 41. And here's a picture of it. I'm going to try to get this close enough so that you can see. Okay, all of the teachers or rabbis were in the temple. That's their church. And Jesus is the little boy that's sitting down <clears throat> in the middle. And you can see that they're all leaning in towards him and they're listening to what he is saying. So I want to read this story to you now about Jesus when he was a young boy. Jesus was so excited. He was 12 years old now and he was going on a special trip for Passover with his mother Mary and Joseph. He was going to be walking a hundred miles to Jerusalem to go to the temple. There were others from Nazareth that were going with his family. Each day, Jesus and his family walked and talked with their friends. Each night, they sat around a campfire and they slept under the stars. That'd be like camping. That was cool. When the people came to Jerusalem, they went to God's house or the temple. Jesus went there too. He liked to visit God's house. 
He liked to hear the teachers talk about God. At last, it was time for the people to go back home. Mary and Joseph left Jerusalem with all of their friends walking back to Nazareth. <clears throat> they started on their long trip back home. They'd walked a while, and Mary said, where is Jesus? And Joseph didn't know. I thought he was with some of his friends, Joseph answered. <clears throat> Mary and Joseph looked everywhere, but Jesus was not with them or any of his friends. Quickly, they turned back towards Jerusalem. They hurried back to the temple. Have you seen a 12-year-old boy named Jesus, they asked. At last, they found him. He was talking to all the teachers in the temple. The teachers looked surprised to hear how much Jesus knew about God. We have been so worried about you, Mary told Jesus. But Jesus answered, didn't you know that I would be here? After Jesus said goodbye to the teachers, he went back to Nazareth with Mary and Joseph. There he grew tall and strong and in wisdom. Everyone loved Jesus, and God loved him too. So boys and girls, this is a story about Jesus when he was a young boy, and he was able to go with his family to Jerusalem. But they got separated and lost. And I know how that feels because once when my little girl was lost in a big store, I was so upset when I couldn't find her. And I bet your parents are that way too. They want to make sure that you're safe. But Jesus was safe. He was back in the temple and he was listening and talking to all the wise people there. And they were so interested in what he said, what a child said. So even as a young child, Jesus was listening and participating in the temple. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful story about Jesus when he was a child. That he was so smart and he was so capable and curious. And that he went to the temple to learn more about you. We ask, dear Lord, that you protect us and you give us wisdom as we learn more about you too. Amen. Today's first scripture reading is Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require? require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. Our second scripture reading is John 1, 43, 51, through 51. <laughs> Jesus calls Philip and Nathaniel. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man.
Good morning. Our lesson this morning comes from the first letter to Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, and they read, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Excuse me for a second. The spirit or the zeitgeist, as I've called them, have prompted me to repeat my opening words from last week, and they are, preachers around this nation are challenged these days to speak a word of gospel truth. There is an expression given to young children in some homes that goes, shame the devil, tell the truth. I've not forgotten that. Shame the devil, tell the truth. In recent years, someone introduced to the American lexicon the idea that there are alternative facts. Shame the devil, tell the truth. It's in a conversation with Jesus that the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, asked my response to that question last week was and will always be, if it ain't love, it ain't truth. If it ain't love, it ain't truth. The Spirit also prompts me to remind you of a line from a benediction I've often shared with you. Um, this benediction was originally spoken by William Sloan Coffin, the former pastor of the Riverside Church in New York City. And that line is, the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And the people all said, Amen. This morning, I will eventually zoom in on the seventh verse that reads, You do not lack any spiritual gift. And from that, I want to seek to encourage you with the theme, You've got what it takes. You've got what it takes. On November 2nd, 1983, the 40th president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, signed into law legislation making the third Monday in January, that's tomorrow, legislation making the third Monday in January, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. But above all else, it is important to note that Martin Luther King Jr. was an ordained Baptist minister. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a Baptist minister. He was a preacher of the gospel. Now, many will say that Reverend King was something other than a minister. Some will say he was an academic. He did indeed have a PhD from uh, Boston University in systematic theology. Some will say that he was a globe-trotting orator, traveling the world, even going off to Oslo, Norway, to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Still others will say that he was an advocate for peace, an advocate for civil rights, an advocate for racial justice, and an advocate for the poor. They will be correct. But I want to remind you this morning that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was an advocate for the gospel of Jesus Christ. As King's legacy is counted, there are those who will say that he stood against war and militarism, saying from the pulpit of the Riverside Church in New York City that a nation that continues to spend year after year more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Yes, he stood against war and poverty, 
But note well, note well, that Reverend King stood for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He stood with the Old Testament prophet Isaiah who would call for the day when they would beat their swords and the plowshares and their spears and the pruning hooks. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood with, with the prophet Amos who called for a day when justice would roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood with Jesus of Nazareth who declared, the blessed are the peacemakers for they shall see God. Blessed are the poor. And he stood with the Jesus who preached, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You see, Dr. King stood for the gospel of our salvation, that same gospel that caused this building to be erected as an earthly outpost for the kingdom of heaven. Ask me why I think the national celebration of the memory of Dr. King is important. I'll tell you that it's important because it's a chance for the nation to consider its ethics. It's a chance for the nation to consider its morality. Now, surely there are those who would say that the ethical and moral issues of the day are widely and hotly debated, and yes, issues are debated, but rarely are they discussed with the ethical and moral yardstick of the gospel, that gospel held up as the divining rod for our well-being as a nation. Because you see, talk about poverty, and somebody will spout back some economic theory, I don't know, trickle down to Chicago school or laissez-faire economic theory and simply say that the impoverished should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Talk about militarism and someone will talk about national interest and just war. Talk about race, gender, and class oppression and someone will start blaming the victim. Talk with Dr. King about any of these topics, and he might say, firstly, I want to review with you the commandment from Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself. The National Day that honors the memory of Martin Luther King Jr. gives the nation and the world a chance to consider its ethics and consider its morality. It especially gives Christians of this nation to consider the practice of our faith. So it turns out that Martin Luther King Jr. and I share a common trait and a common history. We are both African American and we are both Baptist preachers. And I would suggest that the commonality stops there. But when my, when my journey as a preacher began, alongside my seminary training, was the mentor of elder African-American Baptist preachers for preaching the common theme among these elder preachers. What they taught me was that in spite of what I might have been learning in seminary, that the key thing to do is preach the gospel. In practice and by example, they showed me the importance of drawing a connection between the words of the scripture and the lives of individuals, communities, and nations. To fail to make that connection in the words of Reverend Dr. William Barber is to, com is to commit theological malpractice. Just yesterday, a preacher friend of mine in New York City told me this faith is not simply an esoteric encounter with the divine. You see, where the world, where the word meets the world is the motto of a local church pastored by former seminary president, Reverend Dr. James Evan, where the word meets the world. In so many words, those who guided me said, yes, you need to pay attention to what they're teaching you. You need to pay attention to the historical and social and cultural analysis of biblical text. Pay attention when they teach you those hair-splitting techniques for understanding the gospel story. But when you stand behind this sacred desk, your task is to preach the gospel of Christ 
and the gospel of the lo of our the love and salvation that's made known to us to Jesus Christ. To paraphrase the apostle Paul, they were clear that I was to preach Christ crucified. My elders told me frequently and reminded me that the bottom line on preaching was to preach the word, preach the love of God made known to us in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ask an American, ask an African American preacher who was nurtured in the fundamentals of preaching as I was, and they will eventually say, preach the word. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was nurtured as a preacher in this same tradition. The core of his life and his philosophy was proclaim and preach the word. Now I mention all this, to, all this today because people try to say what they think Reverend King would say about major social issues of the day. If you understand his roots, you know that Dr. King would simply preach the word. If you could ask Reverend King about domestic terrorism, he might respond like Jesus of Nazareth and declare, love them that hate you and pray for them that persecute you. You see, Dr. King would preach the word. In his own words, he might add, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. If you could ask Reverend King about health care, he'd likely respond like Jesus of Nazareth and declare whatever you do for the least of these, you also do unto me. Dr. King would preach the word. And if you could ask Reverend King about the American penal system that has more people behind bars than China, Russia, and South Africa combined, he might respond like Jesus of Nazareth, who stood in the temple and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, the recovery of sight to the blind, and the release of the captives. Yea, the release of the captives. You see, the way I'm looking at this, the concept of prison reform is at least as old as the prophet Isaiah. But my point here is Dr. King would preach the word. I believe that if you were to ask Dr. King what to do about immigration, he would probably recite verses 33 and 34 of the Old Testament book of Leviticus, which reads, when a stranger sojourns among you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Ask Dr. King about compassion for the poor, poverty and vast income inequality. And in his own words, he might say, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. So I want to turn your attention now to the text this morning and ever so briefly meditate on, on our lesson, the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, verses 4 to 8. But you see, like Dr. King and like the life of Reverend King, our scripture gives us a chance to think about our ethics and our morality. Our scripture gives us a chance to think about eternity and to think about our salvation. In the days ahead, as you consider your moral and ethical life, your mark on eternity, your salvation, and, and the daily struggles of this life, I want to share with you this one thought. You've got what it takes. Paul writes the Corinthians, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into, into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Here we have a charge from the Apostle Paul to be blameless 
on the day of the Lord, blameless on the day of the Lord. We have a charge that regards our ethics and a charge that regards our morality. It's even a charge that we consider what story history is gonna tell about us. We are called to be blameless on the day of the Lord. Blameless in what you do, blameless in what you allow others to do. Blameless when your life is measured by the commandments of our Lord. I think I should say that again. Blameless when your life is measured by the commandments of our Lord. Now I know that might sound like a big, huge challenge, but I wanna remind you this morning a word from our, from our lesson. You do not lack any spiritual gift. For the work of our faith, Paul reminds us that God will keep you strong until the end. My message this morning is you've got what it takes. My message this morning is you do not lack any spiritual gift. My message this morning is he will keep you strong to the end. Our faith is our salvation. Christ gives us strength, not on the last day, but starting now. He will keep you strong to the end so that you are blameless on the day of the Lord. You've got what it takes. He will keep you strong to the end. I don't know what kind of challenges everybody in this room faces. I know what mine are, but our scripture tells us that he will keep you strong to the end. You've got what it takes. People around you may test the strength of your commitment to the gospel. People will ask you to take sides. You've got what it takes to take the side of the one who says, blessed are the peacemakers. You've got what it takes to live with a peace that passes all understanding. You do not lack any spiritual gift and he will keep you strong to the end. Be confident this morning and be reassured that whatever life puts before you, you've got what it takes. I'm going to ask now that the church would say amen. We continue working our way through our service this morning with um, prayers of the people. Um, thank you so much. We'll solicit any pray, prayer, prayer requests or uh, expressions of joy uh, for, from anyone in the room or anyone any out there in requests, Zoom land. Any praise or uh, blessings? Yes. You have a joy. Okay, they have a new baby, <laughs> a new great-grandson for Wilma, and a, a, a great, a great, she's the great, Phyllis is a great aunt. And what's the baby's name? Donald Arthur. Awesome. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> That's a new baby named John. Donald Arthur is the baby's great uh, name. Okay, thank you. Are there others? I talked to uh, Gail, Galen last night, and um, sh I asked her how her dad was. Jack um, uh, is is in a rehab facility, and because um, uh, he's weak, he went to the hospital. Uh, she said three times in the last month, and so now he's at a rehab, and uh, so she wants prayers for Jack to um, Jack Thomas to um, get stronger and be able to go home and be with Mary Grace. Okay. And uh, we're all uh, wanting to pray for peace for our country, um, for, um, for the inauguration that um, people can um, accept it and accept our new president and have peace again in the land. Are there any coming from, uh, okay, there are no prayers from outside the room. Um, again, you know, again, I just want to emphasize that call came in. You all know that Esther Gay passed away from cancer in common room. This 
past Friday. And again, um, you know, pray for the peace and comfort of her family. And again, uh, Jack Thomas is uh, hospitalized, but when we'll pray for him to get better. Um, yesterday, I got notification that uh, Reverend Gordon Webster, the uh, former pastor of the downtown United Presbyterian Church, uh, is in hospitalized in the ICU uh, with COVID. Um, so, you know, keep your prayers for, uh, uh, does anybody recognize that name? I'm just kind of curious, no, but no, all right. But anyway, I, I count, uh, Webs, you know, uh, Reverend Webster as a, uh, as a friend and colleague. Um, you know, again, you know, you can't put too much emphasis on uh, praying for our nation. Um, these are indeed trying times. Um, I'm sure that most of us never expected to see what we're looking at right now. Um, you know, so, you know, but again, you know, keep our, you know, our, our nation in prayer. And again, I just want to emphasize something I said at the top. It's like, you know, we know it, the truth will set us free. Um, and so I would just, you know, simply ask that, you know, we are all as honest and as truthful about what's going on around us as possible. Um, and I just kind of, I think I'm going to take a moment. You've heard this before, you heard it in this sermon. Um, but I'm going to say it again. If it ain't love, it ain't the truth. If it ain't love, it ain't the truth. And that sits, you know, when I, when I realized that I needed to preach this gospel in all kinds of settings in a pluralistic world, a world that had, you know, Jews and Muslims and, you know, Buddhists and, you know, people from all, you know, religious walks of life, I had to ask myself, it's like, okay, how am I going to navigate that world? And I realized that what needed to sit at the core of my theological posturing was love. You know, that, that, that's it. You know, it's like if you're going to read the Bible, you know, have the word love circling around in your head, you know, and be willing to ask, ask every situation you come in contact with, is this love? Now, the other thing that happened, I realized it actually, it happened in Webster. Um, it happened at the um, Atlantic, oh, what's that, Atlantic Diner up there? Happened at the Atlantic di di Diner. And I was having a conversation with somebody, none of y'all, none of y'all. <laughs> it wasn't any of y'all. <laughs> um, and I realized in the conversation, you know, and this person was, you know, proposing to me these positions and postures that um, to him sounded reasonable. But what I realized was, yeah, they may have re been reasonable and in some kind of macro way would have moved something forward. But the things that he was espousing would cause suffering. And you don't want to have a hand, you know, so part of my theological foundation is I'm not signing up for anything that's going to cause suffering. So again, you know, forgive me for that. Uh, what do you call it when somebody goes off on a tangent for whatever I just did? Um, but I think I, I, I felt like I needed to share that with you. Is this love in any position you stake out, if it causes suffering, uh, it ain't love. Um, let us bow our heads now for a moment of prayer. Would you mind? I'm sorry, what happened? We have a, okay. Liz Henderson. Okay, you have to keep, keep Liz Henderson in your prayers. Uh, she's having some blood tests to see if she can begin her uh, chemotherapy treatments. Okay. Are there other, would you? I don't know what you've prepared, but would you? eternal, gracious, loving, and compassionate God, creator of 
the universe, the one who made it possible for us to breathe air, the one who made it possible for us to drink water, the one who made it possible for us to look and to gaze upon the beauty of the earth, the flowers that you have made, that the butterflies that you have moving amongst the plants and doing that thing called pollination. Yes, dear Lord, we come before you humbly thanking you for all things. Comes to mind this morning that we need to say thank you for pollination. So thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you, Lord, for loving friends and family. Thank you, Lord, for those who would whisper a word of hope and love and compassion into each of our ears. Thank you, Lord, for all things. But more than anything, dear Lord, we say thank you for the gift that you gave us in your son, Jesus the Christ, the one who came and walked among us and taught us how to love, live, the one who said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is life. The one who came among us and said, I give you peace, not as the world gives it. So thank you, dear God, for Jesus, the one who showed us how to live, the one who reminded us that the greatest commandment is to love our neighbors as ourselves. So dear Lord, as we thank you for the spiritual gifts that you've given us as we thank you for the material and emotional gifts that you've given us. We dearly and truly say thank you for your son, Jesus to Christ. But even amongst those thanks, dear Lord, please stop by. There's a song that says, precious Lord, take my hand. There's another song that says, pass me not, O gentle savior, hear my humble cry. So as we seek you, dear Lord, we ask that you would be with those who are hospitalized now for all reasons. Be with those who are suffering in body. Be with those who are suffering in mind. Be with doctors, lawyers, teachers, sanitation workers, lunchroom workers. Be present, dear Lord, in each and every one of our lives. Go to schoolhouses, go to prisons, go to hospitals, go to state houses, especially, dear Lord, go to state houses and say, dear Lord, peace I give you. Say to those who might assemble with anger in their hearts, dear Lord, say to whisper to them, peace I give you. So we're grateful, dear Lord, that we can just take a moment and speak to you, hoping that you might listen but trusting more than anything that thy will shall be done. So thank you, Lord, for this chance to turn our hearts and minds to you. It's in Jesus' name, and for his sake we all pray. Amen. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Master, how shall we pray? And Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Again, I take this moment to uh, remind you that um, your offering can be um, submitted uh, through the website or you can uh, mail your gifts in. And I take a moment now to praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Gracious God, we thank you for these gifts that your people have brought back to you. And again, we ask that you would take these gifts, that you'd multiply them and add to them and see to it they're used to build your kingdom here on earth. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake, all the people of God said together, Amen. Amen. My answer remains to what is truth is if it ain't love, it ain't truth. That's my answer. And I remind you again of the words of William Sloan um, Coffin who said, the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Gracious, eternal, and everlasting God, we ask that you would dismiss us from this place, but dear Lord, that you would never dismiss us from your presence. Give us, dear Lord, the hope that we should have because you have blessed us such that we do not lack any spiritual gift. And we trust, dear Lord, as we leave this place, that you will keep us strong to the end. Bless us now, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake, the people all said, <laughs>